excuse me this morning. <coughs> lose to find. Sometimes that now I know that doesn't make any sense to lose something to find something, but sometimes those things just that's the way they work out better. What you don't think makes sense makes sense. Does not God say my ways are not your ways? You don't think the way I do, therefore, how in the world could you understand the way I am? So sometimes we have to not only think out of the box, but forget that there was even a box there. And forget that we need to be the one that thinks and just listen to what God tells us. But in his word, we look through here, and Jesus is saying in, in the book of Luke, he says, And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. <clears throat> he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be open. But what if I said sometimes, sometimes you don't necessarily, or you can seek all you want, but sometimes you just can't find something. Sometimes it's just we try to look too hard. Y'all ever heard that old saying, looking for a needle in the haystack, you know, it just gets impossible. Or as I was trying to <clears throat> equate with this picture, Sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees. You ever heard that? You know, you're, you're just looking so hard for something that you overlook it. It is right in front of your face the whole time it's been there. And the whole time it's been staring at you. And the funny part is, most of the time, other people around you with you can see it. They're sitting there looking right at it and they're sitting there saying... You know, like, you know, come on, don't you understand? Look, there it is, right there. Why can you not see why you're going through this? Why can you not see what's happening? Why can you not see the very truth? <clears throat> because sometimes what we do is we get our own ideologies, we get our own ideas, and we get our minds so set on something that we can't see what is right in front of our face. Folks, God tells us, that's why He says, don't just try to, don't think about your will, our will, but think about what God's will is in our lives. If we will trust about what God's will is, if we will trust God to lead us, to guide us, and to direct us, then we don't have to worry about if we're going to if we're doing the right thing, if we're, if we're walking the way we're supposed to walk, if we're doing what God has called us. Do you believe that God has called you to do something in life? Do you believe that there is something upon your life that God has got for you? We just talked about how so many times in the Bible, these people that, that you know, we look up to, how many times have they bumbled and fumbled? How many times have they, have they dropped the ball and they've messed up? And we start thinking to ourselves, if you ever look at it, well, hey, Maybe I'm not so bad. Maybe, maybe, maybe God still can use me. Well, of course He can. And He's got something in store for each of us if we will just turn, uh, turn to Him and look beyond what we see in this world. But allow God to show what He's got in store for us in the spiritual world. <coughs> in the book of Acts, <coughs> chapter 9, it says that Saul... Yet breathing out threatening and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, that he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. Saul was on a mission to stomp out and to crush Christianity with no matter what the cost was going to be. His mind was set on these people are his, these people don't know, these people are going against the law. Do they not know the law that was written? You know, Saul was a Pharisee. He was a wise man. He was trained in the Bible, the son of a Pharisee. I remember in the same age, he was, he was a man that was very, very, very educated in the old word of God. And because of this, he had his mind set on one way and was not open to to anything else. Now there is nothing wrong with having your mind set on God. There is nothing wrong with having your mind set on serving and doing what God tells you to do. But when the Son of God had just been walking around and he was sitting there healing and ministering and cleansing and then was crucified and rose from the dead, I believe we need to open up our eyes and look around and let God talk to us like Paul, like Paul or Saul at the time was still not willing to do. 
He did not just trust because he was still trusting in only what he saw. He had it in his mind. He had this vision. His sight was, I've got to go out and stomp out this new movement. That was the only thing that was on his mind. It had become a personal vendetta. Now, when you, become, when you get something so strong and so hard in your life that it becomes your little personal vendetta, folks, have you ever seen anybody going on one of them? It's just like they forget all logic. They forget everything. Here again, they can't see the forest for the trees. They would do harm to themselves even to make sure that the outcome is what they're wanting it to be. I was watching this 2020 thing the other night, late, and all they were showing how these uh, crime, whatever, they redo the crime scene. They try to make it, oh, we've got to prove that this guy did this. And they were trying to do everything they could to make sure the results of a blood splatter would be the same as what it was. And they tried and tried and tried and tried and tried and tried. Man, they went through it over and over. I mean, numerous times just to try to get it to work the same way. And finally, they got it. And it showed the, the from the little cameras, the, one of the women that got up that was doing all the thing. Boy, she jumped up. She did a little happy dance like she just scored a touchdown. And she ran out. They were sitting there saying, isn't that a shame that they had to try so much and go through so much, spend so much time just to prove their point. When if they would just look at it, they might could realize this really isn't the way that it happened. Saul was so intent on doing away with Christianity that he couldn't open up his eyes and see what Jesus had in store for him. It says, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined about him a great light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now, Paul, here he was, like I said, man of sin. He was an upstanding man, but Paul still knew what was going on in the countryside. Back on those days, people usually had to plow. That's what they did. They farmed, they fished. They had to do something. You know, Paul was, we all know Paul was a tent maker. They had to have their trade, but gardening and, and planting was a great, was a huge, huge, huge job back in those days. And they would take their oxen or whatever they would plow with, and they would try to plow the fields. Y'all ever seen those plows where people are, they've got the yoke upon it, and they're, they're sitting behind and they're pulling it. Well, sometimes they just won't move. We've got this little miniature donkey at work. And boy, she's just as cute as she can be. She's probably about this tall, you know, and, and usually she stays with a deer in a certain area, but <clears throat> baby deer have come onto the scene, so we take her out just to make sure nothing is going wrong. Well, we'll put her in the barn, and she being this little donkey, she's just as stubborn as she can be. She don't want to go in, and then once you get her in, she don't want to come out. But we have to take her out because why leave her in there? Take her out, put her in a different pen every day. And she just don't want to come. Now, like I say, to her head, she's here. And it's on down back to there. You can put a little halter on her, hook up a, the lead, and start to pull. And you can get right to where that rope ends. And that's as far as you're going to go. Tiny little thing as she may be, you can pull. You can do whatever you want. But if she don't want to move, she ain't going to move. She's strong. Boy, she's just got it within her. So what we've learned to do is, I get the lead rope, I wrap it around her backside, behind her legs, pull it back through up the halter up top. Then when I start pulling, boy, it starts pulling her backside with her, and she starts hunkering down, and then she'll just walk and walk. And finally, you can let go of the pressure, and she'll just walk by herself. Once you get her going in the right direction, what they had was these big old oxes and all that plow their gardens. <clears throat> so they would get this big old long stick. And when I was reading about it, it's being a big old long stick, I thought, yeah, I bet so. That's a big old animal you fixing to poke. And they had a little sharp thing on the end. They'll poke it in the backside. Like, get going, get going. Well, sometimes, just like with this little donkey, that ox don't want to go. It's got its mind set. It's got its mind made up. And it just don't want to go. And they said that it would kick up against the stick to try to get whatever it was poking in the back, kick the stick to try to get it out of the way. But it didn't do no good because what would happen? 
the farmer just pokes it harder and more until finally it jumps and gets going and its wheel is broke and it goes the way that the farmer wants it to go. <clears throat> Jesus is asking Saul, why in the world are you kicking against the pricks? Why are you trying to kick at me? Why are you trying to <clears throat> ignore what I am trying to tell you? You are an educated man. You know the word that I have given. Why don't you see that from the beginning of time to where we are now, all this word is talked about was, the, was my coming back, was my coming to this world to spread salvation. Why in the world are you being so hard-headed that you can't see that I have come to save, that I have come to, <clears throat> to restore the kingdom? Why can't you see this? Why do you keep kicking against me? Do you not realize that you're going the wrong way? The Bible says that, <clears throat> says there was a, let me get where I was at, sorry. And he said, trembling and astonished, he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the man which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And there he was for three days without sight, neither did he eat, or neither did he drink. So it says the men got him up, and they took him, they took him to the city. And they set him down, and for three days, Saul sat there blind. The Bible says neither did he eat, or neither did he drink. Now my assumption would be that Saul went straight to a time of fasting. He knew all about fasting. He knew all about what was going on. Here he is now, thinking that he's out doing what God wants him to do. Thinking that he's on this mission to tear apart Christianity, to put it down, and all of a sudden he gets a, a visit from, from Jesus that tells him, you need to stop what you're doing. You're going about this all wrong. Why are you trying to kick against me? Why are you trying to put down and stop what I have just got started? So Saul realizes within his heart that maybe something is up. Maybe I have been going the wrong way. Maybe I have been kicking against the face. Maybe I have been being mule-headed so thick that I won't see where God is trying to do and what Jesus is trying to do. Maybe I just don't realize what God has got in store. But it says he asked him, what would you have me to do? And he says, go to the town and you're going to find out. Isn't it crazy how God didn't just tell him right away, Saul, I'm going to, I want you to change your name to Paul. I want you to become the best, the greatest missionary that the Bible world has known. No. He said, you'll find out in a little bit. Ain't that the way God works, you know? Keeps us in suspense sometimes, you know? Hey, God, what's your name? I'll tell you later. But just go. Just get going. Our faith is put to test. Just get going, trust and believe, get going, and I will let you know. But isn't that crazy how it's three days? Get to looking. How long was Jonah in the belly of a whale? Well, three days. How long was Jesus there? Three days. Man, life changes at three days. Something is going on with this three days. So here Paul is three days. He's sitting there in the city waiting. And it says, There was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in the vision, Ananias, behold, I am here, he said. He said, Lord said to him, Arise and go into the street which is called Beautiful, straight, and inquire, which is called straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarshish, for behold, he prayed. And he seen in the vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. And then I said, Lord, I've heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to the saints at Jerusalem, and that he hath the authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on his name. Here he is, Saul going through this mighty turn, turning turmoil in his life, this mighty change, and all of a sudden somebody else is getting more or less thinking I'm getting thrown to the wolves. Here I am getting thrown to the lions or whatever. Because now you want me, God, to go and tell this person that's more or less was coming here to get me, more or less coming to get me to throw me into jail, coming to get me to bind me up and take me off. Why in the world, God, would you put me in this situation? Folks, let me tell you this. If God is calling you to go do something, as the Bible says, as an angel would always say, fear not. 
If God has got a call on your life and a plan, go and do what your call and your plan is. Because if God has given you that desire, then He's also given you that ability. If God is trusting you to go do a work, then He's also going to give you the tools that it's going to take to do the work. Yesterday afternoon, I come over here and that old oak tree down around the pavilion. I thought, you know what? It's just getting too grown up. It's just got way too much. I'd come over here before one other time and, and I looked at it. That's about as much as I got done on that part because I didn't have the right tools with me. But yesterday, I was able to bring a chainsaw and I had a tall ladder. So with a chainsaw and a tall ladder, I was able to get down there and trim the trees that needed to be trimmed. I had the right tools. It was a great day to do the work. I had the ladder to step up. If God is calling you to do something, don't worry about not having the ability. God will give you the ability. Don't worry about having not having the right tools. God will give you the tools that you need to do the job that He has called you for. Look back. What did He tell Moses? He told Moses, look at what is in your hand. Take that rod, and with that rod, you and I are going to do great things. What did he tell Samson? Samson, pick up that jawbone and fight and do what you're supposed to do. Thousands died. A few minutes later, Samson's like, whoo, I'm tired and I'm thirsty. Jesus or God tells him, look what's in your hand. Look in that jawbone and that little hollow spot. I've now made it a water spigot. Drink all that you need so that you can drink and be fulfilled. If God has got a plan for you, if God has got something called for you to do, you just do it. Let God supply as you go. Don't be afraid to step out. Don't be afraid as Ananias was all worried. But you don't understand. He's the one that's coming to get us. He has the power to bind us up. The priests have given him. The, the, the governor has given him all the paperwork he needs to come and put down Christianity and to bind us. But Jesus tells us in Matthew 18, Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. <clears throat> Again I say unto you that if the two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that you shall ask, and shall be done for my Father which is in heaven. Jesus says, I'm giving you, my children, the power to bind. Don't worry about if you think that Satan's out there and that he has the power. The Bible says that he is, small little word there, as a roaring lion. Didn't say that he was one, but he's as one. He tries to look big. He tries to act big. He tries to scare you. But folks, the Lion of Judah, the Lion of Judah, not me like as a Lion of Judah, but the Lion of Judah, when he tells you to do something, when you've got him with your back, when you've got him walking with you, folks, there is nothing that you have to worry about. Everybody, you was talking about the Dobermans earlier that you have walking in your yard. Imagine if your guard dog was a big old full-grown lion. I don't think you'd have to worry about nobody breaking in your house. You don't have to worry about nobody coming to try to take you over because there's a lion at the gate. Folks, we've got the lion at our gate. He walks before us and you know they say a lion's roar can be heard for miles. For miles it can be heard across the, the area that we're there, across the prairies and the tundras. It can be heard for miles away. Don't you know as the lion of Judah walks and as he roars that the demons tremble knowing that here comes Jesus. He's coming this way. We better split the path. We don't care who's with them because whoever's with them, he must love them and he's taking care of them. So leave that one alone. And a knife starts walking. Okay, God, if that's what you want me to do, then that's what I'm going to do. He said, go your way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Whew. Now, look what Ananias has got. Okay, God. If you want me to get over this fear of, of going to this man that's going to arrest me, you're going to protect me, I will do it. And then Jesus, or, you know, talking to Jesus here, he throws in the old token. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to make him one of the greatest that there is. He's going to talk to kings. He's going to do the, he's going to, he's going to be in charge of it all. But I need you to go and lay hands on him and pray with him. 
But what if Ananias said, well, hold on, I need to spend three or four days fasting myself. If I gotta go, if I gotta get myself right to go pray for somebody that's gonna be this good, no pressure, Ananias. But get in there and do it. <clears throat> this kind of shows us, folks, which the Bible says he's one of his disciples. You better stay prayed up. Because you never know when God is going to call you to do something. You never know when God is going to put, fill your plate up and say, go eat. You just never know when God is going to entrust you to do something. So it says he goes out immediately. And Ananias went his way, entered into the house, putting his hands on, his, on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus appeared unto thee in thy way that thou camest, has sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes they had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and he arose and was baptized. And when he received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with disciples, which were at Damascus, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. That he is the Son of God. Here he is three days, three days late to, his, late to the curb, blind, whatever, not eating, he's fasting. And the Bible says he comes in, lays his hand on him, prays with him. And it says immediately, straightway, the scales fell from his eyes. Or like the scales fell from his eyes, the Bible says. Saul had a vision to go and do what he thought was correct. He had to lose his vision to find the one that God had in store for him. And I like what it said. He didn't waste no time. It says right away he went into the temple and started preaching to the masses. It doesn't matter what you've been doing. It doesn't matter where you've been in life. It doesn't matter what you've done yesterday or even this morning. God has got something for you. And he's telling you, let's get that behind us and let's walk forward. Don't waste any time. Why do you think no time was wasted? Because when you waste time, what's that old, that old saying, idle hands, idle time, is a devil's workshop. Get busy for God. Saul didn't waste any time. He didn't start thinking, okay, well, let me go back and regroup. Let me go back to the, let me go back to where I come from and get all my, get everything straight and tell my family. No, it says he went straightway and started preaching. Folks, when you might have, you might have stumbled and fell and, and fell by the wayside, you might have done so much, but <clears throat> until you lose what the you part out of this equation, until you lose what you want to do in life, until you lose what you think that your plans are, and you discover and you find what God's plans are in your life, the Bible tells us we're going to be of all men most miserable. We're never going to have peace. We're never going to have comfort. We're never going to be able to lay down at night. It's going to be like our day was if this day would just hurry up and get over. We're not going to have that joy that God wants us to have. But if we will lose us in the equation and find God and find what God's got for them, forget what our agenda is and start looking at God's ministry, forget what we want to make in our life, and they ask God, God, what do you want for us to do in our life? Then we're going to find what we're supposed to be. Then all of a sudden, it's going to be like the scales have fallen off of our eyes and we can go out and we can start to work. We can start to live as God has placed. Watch the blessing just start to flow. Watch the doors start to open. Watch our life start to change right before our newly opened eyes. If we will just lose ourselves and find God. Matthew says this, Jesus says in the book of Matthew, Then said Jesus, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake, he shall find it. You've got to lose you, get you out of the equation except for God. What can I do for you? Get everything else out of the equation Lose yourself in God. What is, 
It is so awesome just to be lost. You ever get down in your prayer closet and you get to pray and you get to talking with God and the next thing you know, you look around. It's done been 30, 45 minutes. It's done been an hour. I've been in here worshiping, praising God, praying to God. Boy, next thing you know, time is gone. But boy, don't you feel strengthened. Don't you just feel like the Spirit has just risen up and He's become that marrow to your bones. He's become that strength that you need all because you forgot about you and you started trusting in God. Luke says... <clears throat> Remember the, or in Luke, Jesus says, remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. You've got to lose yourself. Boy, that's so hard to do. Because we think we're the ones that got to take care of ourselves. No, you let God take care of you. You let God tell you which way to go. So many people don't believe in anything. How could you not believe in anything? How could you not believe in a creator look at this world and see where it all is and see how we're just far enough away from the sun where we don't burn up? We're just far enough away from the sun where we don't freeze to death. Look at how the plants that are out there gives us back the oxygen that we need. Look how everything is put into place. How could you deny the very power of a creator our God? Unless you're just hung up on you. Hung up on you. Now, a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that was what you lost. Believe in him. Come to the instruments. Here's old Paul, or Saul. Knocked down, and life before him, he's blinded. He can't see anything. And he's at the mercy of of the voice that he is hearing. I told you this before. One time I was up underneath this machine at work. Uh, probably late 80s. And a tube, a hose busted. And all these chemicals come down. Boy, they got in my eyes. And it was just torturing. It was just burning, burning. So I jump up and finally get to a, a sink. You know, and I'm sitting trying to get all this water to go in my eyes. I couldn't get to that. Boy, it was just burning. Finally, somebody come over there because, you know, when your eyes were burning, you kind of can't really hold them open. It's, I can't even put eye drops in. I don't know how people put eye drops in, much less contacts. But, but anyways, I'm sitting there, and a buddy comes over, and he's sitting there, screws the water hose on, and he starts sitting there trying to shoot it all of my eyes and clean my eyes out so that, you know, we can get it going. And somebody else is calling the hospital. They're like, bring him on up to the hospital. Get him up here as quick as you can. You know, but let his eyes were wash out for 10 minutes, then get him here, you know. And I'm trying to hold my eyes open. He's trying to squirt the water in. You know, I can't see nothing. Finally, it's been the 10 minutes. He said, let's, let's go, let's go. So they grab me some cheesecloth, and I grab it up and put it over my, my eyes, and we start to, to walk out. I am reliant, trust me, upon this guy. I can't see nothing. We're walking or kind of go through this maze of tables. He's having to lead me. Get to the door. We go out. We get in the car or his truck and, and we take off to the hospital. <clears throat> now, I know beyond the shadow of a doubt, we're not just doing the speed limit. I mean, we're, we're getting it. We're getting on down the road. And unless I'm sadly mistaken, I think it was Parkview. That Brown Hospital used to be at Third Thorne Road. I know what that was called, Parkview Hospital. It didn't, it seemed like it didn't take but a minute to get there. And I'm sitting there thinking, Lord, if my eyes don't even get better, at least I'm not going to be able to see what we hit. And we're going so fast, I ain't going to feel it anyways. So if my buddy Eddie was flying, he had the needle buried. And I was just thinking, at least I'll never see the wreck coming, you know. But we get there and I go in and they, they do all this stuff and they get us get me all bandaged up, put bandages on my eyes. Dennis, how you gonna get home? Well, get somebody to drive me, you know. I, I got enough a friend that can do that for me, so get me home. I have to wear a patch for two days on this side and a week and something on this side. That, then I can take that patch off. But being reliant like, you know, on somebody else when you, when you can't see, that's a weird feeling. Even though I once got vision back in this eye, I would still drive myself to work. But it's a scary thing when you're driving at this point in the road. You have 
couple of lanes. All of a sudden, the car would go flying by you. No idea it was even beside you. You couldn't see over there. Still had impaired vision. Still couldn't see. So didn't know what I was going on. That's the way our Christian life. So, plus, if we got to put us, we got to be able to trust and rely on God. If you're trying to do it with your own eyesight, as Paul says, we look through a glass darkened. We can't see what God wants for us. We've got to trust in Him. That sixth verse of chapter 9, Saul says this, Trembling and astonished, he said, Lord, what will they have? What will thou have me to do? The Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. That's what God is telling us. Arise, get up, and go. I'll tell you what to do when you get there. But right now, Lose your vision. Lose what you think. And find what God wants for you. Stand to your feet.